All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Democracy Champions, building the 21st democracy to meet the moment. My name is Brittany Baxter. And I don't know why my. All right, I think this is. All right. Try that again. My name is Brittany Baxter, and I'm the training and movement building coordinator for the Democracy Initiative. You can follow me on social media at Bax Brittany or at Unite for Democracy. We're going to be tweeting out today, so please tweet at the, at the Democracy Initiative and tweet DI at NN20. And then, um, Joanne, why don't you introduce yourself? Sorry, we had a technical difficulty. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joanne, uh, Executive Director of Common Cause Maryland. Uh, Common and Common Cause is part of the Democracy Initiative. Uh, I'm joining y'all from Maryland, but originally from uh, the Jersey Shore. Thanks, Joanne. So we are really excited to be at Netroots. This is my third Netroots. And Joanne, which Netroots is this for you? This is my second Netroots. Second. Awesome. Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump into actually the Democracy Initiative, who we are. So the Democracy Initiative is a, co is a national coalition of about 75 national, organi national partner organizations with a combined 45 million members. And so we are committed to democracy reform that is rooted in the grassroots and, and connects power, democracy, and the issues that matter to you. And what we do, we have partners from labor, from the faith community, from civil rights and environmental justice communities. We also have the traditional good government groups who work on democracy. And we bring all of these folks together to center around a race class analysis that centers democracy and the, from the perspective of what it takes to fight for democracy 365 days a year. So Joanne, can you talk a little bit about the Democracy Initiative and how we're showing up in this perfect storm, this historical mm -hmm. moment? Yeah, I mean, as I'm sure you all know, uh, obviously COVID-19 has impacted what seems like every aspect of our lives, right? People are worried about their rent, uh, their, you know, unemployment and so forth. And what we're also seeing is a number of changes that are being made to our election processes. Um, some positive, right? Some that are uh, encouraging uh, safety voting in our states and others that unfortunately uh, leave voters at risk of being disenfranchised. Uh, there's also another, a number of other issues like, you know, having to have polling location changes and, uh, uh, how would I say, a decrease in the number of election judges or poll workers that we would typically have. Uh, so what the Democracy Initiative have, has been doing uh, is launching, I would say, a, a, a large I'd call it an election protection effort, but it's it's election protection with a combination of voter education and and um, election preparedness, right? I, I can use Maryland as an example where uh, we are no longer mailing out ballots and voters are having to go through this unnecessary hurdle of requesting um, ballots. But in addition to that, we have a 14,000 uh, judge uh, gap, right? We're needing to fill these positions. So Democracy Initiative is going to be coming in to help us recruit judges. They'll also be training activists all throughout the state who understand how vote by mail systems work, who will know how uh, Marylanders should go about safely voting and so forth. So really helping us build an infrastructure uh, that ensures all Marylanders are informed um, and that we're also able to put together a rapid response effort on election day to address uh, issues that might be happening. And again, this is just Maryland, uh, but it's similar all throughout um, the country, right? Really honing in on the people power that exists uh, and building this infrastructure that'll help us uh, navigate this chaos of an election that we're seeing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Joanne. And so all of this work that we're doing in priority target states is rooted in our platform. We have um, three core values that we are fighting for, and that's to increase voter participation and increase in civic engagement, to blunt the influence of corporate influence uh, and money, and to create a representative government that is reflective of the people. Right, and so the way that we're doing this now is we are doing, we're working on several initiatives, right? I'm the training and movement building coordinator. I'm responsible for all of the leadership development and I am, and I am working on training, recruiting and mobilizing a, an army of volunteers, democracy defenders who are going to fight in their states to protect, educate 
and defend their rights and access to a safe and secure election and beyond. Because we understand that this year, we are not going to know who the winners are on election night because of the increase in vote by mail. We are going to have, it's going to take weeks and maybe even a month to count the votes and to identify who the winners are. And then we have to prepare for the potential battle in the courts because we know that the opposition is going to fight and will continue to fight tooth and nail to prevent us from winning because we are winning. And so these efforts that are ramping up are because they see that we are mobilizing and we're coalescing in this moment to channel the collective power that we've not tapped as a people in a while. So today, I just wanna start a little bit us off with some ground rules. I ask that everyone be fully present, um, move up, move back. And we ask that you take up a lot of space you just kind of give room for other folks to ask questions and to um, get clarity. I want folks to be open to different perspectives. You may hear different perspectives, things you may not agree with or understand. Um, and just mute yourselves when you're not talking. And if you have questions, comments, share them in the chat box at the bottom. And Joanne will respond to those as, uh, as quickly as she can. And I just want to flag, because I, I remember this, Joanne mentioned election judges. In Maryland, election judges are what we call poll workers. And so those poll workers, those poll monitors, those volunteers, those are folks that we're going to be recruiting across the country to make sure that in those key states, we're preserving and protecting and defending our elections and voters' rights to show up and be heard at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. I wanted to flag for you that we have folks saying something about sound. So if you're able to maybe come closer, they Absolutely. want to be able to hear Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Is this better, folks? Can y'all hear me? I can speak louder. I think just speak louder. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right, so today let's talk about our objectives. So we're gonna really, this is, um, this is a screenshot of, the, of our core democracy champions training, which is in a proper education model training that is intended to connect the dots between understanding power, democracy, expanding the idea of democracy and connecting it to the, the kitchen table issues that have impact your everyday life so that we can agitate and empower folks to take action and to change, take their, um, to take democracy into their own hands to build power and affect the change they want to see. So today we're going to name our opposition, call out their motivations and tactics so that we know that we see them, so that we can communicate the ways to build the trust in the voting system and using a, a race class analysis and prepare voters and to prepare voters, volunteers, and everyone to understand what is happening now, right? And I'll clearly define what our counter strategy is. We have to fight back. And it's gonna take thousands of volunteers and we'll talk about how we plan to do that, right? Then we're also gonna talk about how we can use inoculation as a counter suppression strategy. If you're unfamiliar with inoculation, it is essentially preemptively predicting what the opposition is going to do and educating folks on what's coming so that you can provide them with the information and that, so they can be prepared to defend against those attacks. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna inspire folks to act. We need y'all to step up. So let's get started. <laughs> All right, so Joanne, um, Joanne and I are, Joanne is actually one of my co-trainers for the Democracy Champions training. We've done several of these trainings. We've trained hundreds of folks. Uh, this year, we've already trained about 600 people, and we have a goal of about 3,000 at least trainers, trainers that we want to mobilize in the states to move this work. And so the point of these trains are really to connect with that, I'm just reiterating, about vote by mail and our voting, the stakes that we're fighting for, um, making sure that we're recruiting these folks and recognizing that if you're unfamiliar with popular education, popular education model trainings use the lived experiences of participants to connect the dots on the information that they're, that they're getting. So I am not a teacher. I simply facilitate the brilliance that's already in the room. So let's get to facilitating. <laughs> so this is just a this is a preview of what the agenda looks like in our, in our typical Democracy Champions training. It's approximately 90 minutes to two hours. We encourage folks to ask questions to engage. Um, virtually, we ensure that there are videos, um, case studies, and, and examples to tie the theory to real life and how folks are executing these, um, these strategies on the ground. It's really important that we also teach in, um, we teach folks how to have these conversations and how to talk about this in a way that connects to other folks who aren't in this work. And so that is a priority for us. We talk and we meet people where they're at so that they can understand and also become advocates. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So now that we've touched on what it is we're doing, how we're planning on doing it, let's talk, let's start talking about the opposition. So we're all here today because it's obvious that corporations and wealthy interests have a plan. We are fighting the wealthy 1% that has gained trillions during this coronavirus pandemic, right? They have used this as an opportunity to take what, to strip the rest of us of whatever wealth is left. And so this election determines whether or not they maintain that power for the next step, for the several, next several generations, right? We're not just electing, we're not just electing a president. We're, elect, we're determining who the next Supreme Court judges are. We're determine, determining what the policies will look like domestically and globally in, for the next four years. And it's important that we recognize that there's so much at stake that they're gonna do whatever they can to make sure that we don't believe that we're winning. And because they see with these uprisings, with the response, with the, the botched response to the pandemic, with all of this death and desperation, with folks um, losing their jobs and their rent and this economic crisis, Americans are standing up and paying attention. And we know that we have the collective power to move and shift this system and change the power dynamics. And so we have to be aware that they're going to fight to delegitimize vote by mail and the election we have had vote by mail in some form or capacity since the Civil War. It is safe, it is effective, it works. 26% of the votes counted in 2016 were cast by absentee ballot, and that is important to note. This has been around, it works, and we can tap into it and expand it so that all of us have access to safe, secure elections. And so we have to anticipate, we anticipate and we've already seen that they're using the pandemic to scare voters from showing up in person, and then, Casting, casting doubt on the vote by mail infrastructure while sabotaging the postal service, which is an instrumental element of our elections, right? And so the name of the game is disinformation, misinformation, and more disinformation. They are flooding social media. They are flooding the news with a ton of false information to confuse you. And we on the left have a tendency to mistakenly elevate that message and we have to we have to see the game and shift to a positive message and talk about what we are accomplishing, what we are winning in states in Michigan, where we saw two million absentee ballots requested and 1.6 million of them actually returned. That is tremendous. And this is the first election since they actually pushed for voting reforms in 2018. And we're seeing that these reforms work and that's why they're fighting so hard because they know when we get the reforms and we have access to the ballot, we show up, we demand change and we hold them accountable. So the reality is they know already that vote by mail works because we have it in five states. These states are mostly homogenous, predominantly white states and these states also see significantly higher consistently rates of turnout to the tune of about 10 percentage points than the rest of the country. So in these states where folks have access to drop boxes, to voter centers, to automatic ballots, ballots automatically being sent to their homes, right? People use them and they show up and they engage. And so we deserve this in Georgia and in Florida and Wisconsin and in Michigan and in Maryland. And so we're demanding what they have in those states. It is possible. And in order for us to get it, we have to continue to hold our ground and to fight and demand and push that we have what they have in California, Colorado, Washington states and the other three states that we mentioned. Okay. Folks, let me know if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> I am from New York, so I have a tendency to, to speed through things. Um, I think you're fine. Okay, good, good. I just want to check in. I can't see y'all. I wish I could see your faces, but <laughs> I can't. So, so the reality is, um, you know, we're facing unprecedented suppression efforts, right? Even this week to hear, to hear the opposition admit to intentionally sabotaging the Postal Service, right? We are facing a constitutional crisis. We're facing a public health crisis. We are facing the potential collapse of our country and democracy as we know it here. And that is not me being dramatic, even though I tend to be, have a flair for, for drama, but it's the reality that we're facing. And so 
because we're facing these unprecedented suppression efforts, things that we've only seen consistently in places like Florida and Georgia, those swing states that are so crucial. We're seeing this across the board now, right? We've seen voter ID laws explode. We've seen the voter purges and felony disenfranchisement, gerrymandering. All of these intentional efforts that target black and brown people and marginalized communities to ensure that their voices are not heard, right? And so, Joanne, I just wanna kind of shift to you for you to talk a little bit about the COVID, the layer that the pandemic has added to this and how it's impacting black and brown folks. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was actually watching uh, Stacey Abrams keynote yesterday and I think she, uh, she was referring to thinking of scenario Z, right? Or she credited uh, Congresswoman uh, Warren, obviously. Um, but, you know, I say all that to say in no way, I think, did anyone expect for there to be postal service issues, you know, coming up during the election. You know, so much so that a jurisdiction like Baltimore City, right, a city that is historically uh Ha experienced a number of election issues uh, is majority black, you know, where we're seeing right now voters who, um, or I should say residents who aren't receiving their mail at all, right? People who are supposed to receive unemployment checks, uh, people who are waiting on their medication and so forth, who haven't received mail in over two weeks. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, while Maryland made the right decision during the primary, you know, our Republican Governor Hogan automatically mailed ballots. And because of that, even though Baltimore City received its ballots the latest out of everyone, Baltimore had the highest turnout in the election altogether, right? The highest in the state and the highest historically. Um, so the governor wanting to add this additional step now where we're mailing out applications instead, where we're seeing all it, when we already know that the city is experiencing mail delays, again, is showing us that while he has been saying that he wants to ensure that he's di not disenfranchising black and brown voters, right? We will see that, right? And and unfortunately, what we might end up seeing on election day is long lines like we saw in the primary. You know, Baltimore City voters were standing on top of one another, right? They were unable to social distance at these facilities and in line until midnight, you know, for lines that were four hours long. And now we've got this additional mail piece uh, where the governor refuses to budge with us and where the city just isn't receiving its mail at all. Um, so our concern is not, just that the voter won't get their application in time, but now that they won't actually get their ballot, uh, and and even if the ballot comes in, will it be returned and by the postal service and so forth, right? So that's just one example in the city alone, but obviously this is something that will impact uh, the state. Um, and and it's something that Governor Hogan could honestly, uh, with the snap of the finger, you know, really address right now by instructing uh, our state board of elections to automatically mail ballots instead of doing this application process first. Absolutely. Thank you, Joanne. Now, it's crucial to think about um, what I would like for folks to do is I want you to jump into the chat and think about other forms of voter suppression that we're seeing now. Um, I, I think specifically of lack of translated materials and access to information, right? Mm -hmm. People do not know where to go. And so they're getting that information from social media. And a lot of times it's not accurate. It's not clear. And so we have to make sure that we are calling it out in advance, anticipating and being prepared. Do folks have any ideas of other forms of voter suppression they've seen that are COVID related or just historical that you don't see on the slide? Yeah, I'll read them out as you put them. But if you put them in the chat, y'all, I'll read them aloud. Um, choosing polling locations. Yep. You know, I think this is where vote centers work really well, right? Because the voter in the county can go to any location um, instead of having to be able to navigate a precinct level location, especially during the uh, poll worker, um, you know, deficit that we have. Absolutely. I see from Ellen, Ohio limiting secure drop boxes to one per county. That is insane. That is insane. That's and it is intentional. I saw, we saw yesterday, in, um, in Oregon and in, and in Washington, they are picking up mailboxes. The Postal Service is pulling mailboxes mm -hmm. out of the ground and taking them so that people cannot deliver their votes. Mm -hmm. In states that have vote by mail, that is crazy. And yeah. we have to recognize that we need to have a backup plan and a backup plan for the backup plan because mm -hmm. they are pulling out all the stops and they're not even pretending that cheating is, they're not even pretending anymore. 
They're yeah. just, if they're going to put out all the stocks, we have to match that energy mm -hmm. because they're doing it because they know they've already seen in the primaries mm -hmm. where this is going and they know that we're going to show up and be heard and we're not willing to risk this election. And so we have to make sure that we show them that their money doesn't match our collective power. Mm -hmm. Here's more. Bruce says, not in, oh, not in GA or AI. Uh, Y'all got yeah. that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Aware okay. police were stopping buses of elderly black voters. Yep. Wow. From senior. That level. was in Georgia. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Students. Students. Plan on being. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I see from Selena students who don't know what the rules are for how they can vote, where they can vote, if they're staying on campus or coming back. Right. Those are actually really important things to think about because in a lot of places, um, I know in North Carolina. HBCUs um, in Charlotte make up a significant portion of the population and those vote, and they vote. And so it's important to have a plan to educate students on how they can make sure that they can protect their vote because millennials and Generation Z now are the largest voting block. And it's important that we know that and we, we educate and protect and defend folks and so they can arm themselves and make sure that they're still a part of the, the process. This is happening in Florida. They're taking out postal drop boxes where seniors live. Yeah, yeah. And we have to anticipate. They're going to show up. Um, they're going to show up and try to intimidate voters at the at the polls. And so we have to be prepared for that as well. Which is why we need you all to join the fight and mobilize and step up, right? So in 2016, it took 900,000 poll workers to run the election. The average age of a poll worker is 70. I remember having a conversation after the primary in Florida with someone to see how, how it went. 60% of their poll workers quit within the two weeks before the election. And so you can imagine in a place that is, that may, when South Florida makes up two thirds of the Demo, of, of, let me not say that. Um, the reality is, is we are seeing a huge gap. We have a huge gap to fill, and that's just election workers, but we don't need just election workers. We need folks who are registering, educating voters. We need folks who are guiding people through how to fill out your ballot, because it doesn't matter if you get your absentee ballot and you fill it out wrong. It will be thrown out. In New York, in New York City, 25% of the ballots were thrown out because they were not filled out correctly. That is important to know. That shifts an election. That changes the results. And so we have to make sure that people not only know how to get their ballot, they know how to fill it out. They get it in on time. And they're educating everyone around them and talking to them to make sure that they know the same thing, right? And because we can't all be together, we have to organize virtual house parties so we can bring folks together and talk about this and, and educate folks and answer the questions, right? And we need you activists, we need trainers, and we need folks recruiting volunteers to mobilize so that we can stand in the gap and protect our democracy and be very clear about what it is we're coming to do on November 3rd. And so we need democracy champions and defenders, y'all. And so we have these states that we're fighting in and the way that we're going to do this, I'm gonna tell you right now what it looks like because we've thought about this a lot, right? We, we've seen this coming. So now we're gonna shift to what our counterattack in the fight for democracy looks like. Because just because they have a plan, we have one too. So we're here today because it's important that we reclaim our democracy, right? We've already passed the historic election that would determine where we're headed. Now we're trying to do damage control, right? So we have to mobilize those folks who are ready to be change makers. We gotta recruit those thousands of election workers, those vote by mail captains, those activists, folks who are just now paying attention and saying, wait, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't seem right. How can I stand up? How can I make sure that this does not continue to go on, right? And so that looks like, it looks like it's like a, it's a two, it's a two uh, phase strategy, right? We have to be on the ground in states and we have to let the grassroots organizations that are engaging in the communities that are being targeted have the, the support and the capacity to do the work that they're doing. We need to demand that federal funding for the election, right? We, um, folks have been calling, we are calling for $3.6 billion for the election so that we can have safe, secure in-person options and vote by mail across the country. We are demanding that that is in the next stimulus package and you need to call your senators to demand and put pressure on them that they support this, that they support this funding. 
We need it. It is not a negotiation. It is our money, and we need to continue to push for it, right? We also have to shift the voting narrative to counter these disinformation campaigns that we're seeing, right? We are suppressing our own votes when we elevate and lift up the language of the opposition, and we share that information. We don't need to share what they're saying. We don't need to talk about what they're doing. We need to pivot back to our message. Our message is, this is our democracy. We are going to defend it. We're going to fight by any means necessary. And we're going to show up, and no matter what you throw at us, we're going to fight to defend the Postal Service. We're going to fight to defend our access to the ballot. We're going to protect our co-workers, our elderly, and those who are at risk, and make sure that this pandemic, the response to this pandemic is something that does not happen again in this country. All right, and the second piece of that is where I come in, y'all. So I love training, if you haven't noticed. Um, and so we at the Democracy Initiative have launched 100 days of training. We are on day 81 now, on the countdown to the election. And so what we are doing, I mentioned this earlier, we want to train 3,000 3, volunteers in this next 100 days. We have about 600 folks already under our belt, and we're working with uh, partner organizations, but we will train anyone. We will partner with anyone to host training. And so Joanne right now is going to drop a link in the chat if you want to use that to sign up for a training, if you and your organization are interested in this training and in a, a training about how to inoculate folks against disinformation, about how to fight back, about how to funnel folks into poll worker, into poll worker positions in key states. We're doing all of that. And so we're going to be recruiting these folks, but I can't do all of this by myself. I'm one person. I like to sleep. And so it would be nice if y'all join me so that we can train these folks, educate them, and then plug them in the roles in the state so that we can fight together. Joanne, do you have any, um, from the grassroots perspective, the work that is taking on the ground, what you all are seeing? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I, I mean, obviously we're continuing our advocacy here in Maryland um, while telling people to move forward with requesting their ballot. Um, but I think some of the largest needs is going to be, again, what you said, right, around voter education. People don't know that our election process has changed yet again. So folks at home right now, you know, if you're someone who's thinking about where your next paycheck is going to come from, right? Or your health, you're not thinking about how to vote on election day. You just are expecting now that a ballot is gonna to come to you. Um, so I think for us, the critical piece has been uh, groups that might not traditionally work on elections, stepping up to help get the information out, um, as well as joining election protection efforts uh, as voting starts in the state. Election protection looks a lot different this time. You know, it's not as easy for folks to stand outside at polls. Um, you know, so it might be a roving election protection person where you're in a car, keeping track of what's happening out there, and obviously stepping out where needed. But Voter education right now is key. If you can tell people, uh, we've been telling folks to help flatten the ballot curve, right? We don't want requests to all of them to come in in October. We want people to make their requests right now uh, in order so that the local boards can um, process them and get them out in time. So request your ballot and uh, help us uh, with voter education by telling someone else to do the same. Absolutely. That's a great flag. And another example of what happens when that when we don't uh, push folks to apply early in Flint in the primary, there were 10,000 ballots, ballot applications that were not processed. And there were two weeks ago to the election. Right. And so we had to push and figure out how we work with the election officials to make sure they have the support that they need to do this work to process those ballots so that people can get their ballots, right? And it's important to know that we're still fighting these fights and shifting and creating solutions, right? So we have to have rapid response teams ready to jump in because these crises are gonna continue to pop up every single day. As we get closer, they're gonna ramp up and we need to be on our toes, y'all. All right, now, the reality is, is that None of this is going to work if we don't make a plan, if we don't make plans as organizations on how we're going to mobilize our members, educate folks, create a consistent stream of valid, accurate information, because that is so important. And to make sure that folks have their roles and their positions and the support that they need so that we can have the army that it's going to take to beat back fascism. Um, so vote by mail, uh, the reality is that it can change the game and it is going to be an instrumental part in us fighting to shift this election and to protect and defend voters. And so what this looks like, 
um, the way that we make sure that vote by mail is implemented in an equitable and fair way and it's supported is making a plan. We have to combat voter suppression. Vote by mail is just one element of how we do this. And so we at the DI, we this is a three-step process. It's real simple. Step one, folks need to know the rules. You need to familiarize yourself with your local election officials. You need to identify those trusted validators, the organizations that are doing the work, the the experts, um, your state, your state, uh, your state board of election or your election officials, right? Identify those folks who are doing the work, understand what, what the deadlines are, but know that the deadlines are just a guideline. Mm -hmm. Local pressure will shift and change things. And so keeping your foot on the necks of the folks who are trying to suppress our votes is gonna be super important. When the deadlines don't match up with the process, we push and we change and we saw it. Folks were demanding that that primaries be de delayed in states because of safety issues, and it was effective. In Wisconsin, they didn't delay. In, in Ohio, they delayed, right? Like, it's important to make sure that you are mobilizing. It's important to make sure that you're mobilizing folks to know the rules and you are sharing that information. Everyone needs to have access to the same consistent information. Step two, make a plan. Make a plan as an organization, make a plan as a voter. You need to check your registration status, make sure that everything is correct, apply for that ballot, and send that ballot application in as soon as possible. You may have to, if you're seeing delays, you may have to walk that into your board of elections, right? You don't wanna risk it. The closer we get, the, the harder it's going to be, right? And so making sure that as soon as you get that ballot, you fill it out and you return it ASAP. You send, you drop it in the drop box, you send it to the Board of Elections, you send it through the Postal Service, you do what you need to do to get it back as soon as possible so you know that your ballot is going to be counted. And in many states, there's ballot tracking that is through the Postal Service, and you're going to need to put pressure on your state electeds for them to opt into that. The reality is, is ballot tracking is not expensive. It is not, an, it is not expensive at all. And there are, um, there are, two core vendors who support ballot tracking to make sure that ballots are being tracked and you as the voter can see where your ballot is in the process, right? And then the third part is the part that I am screaming from the rooftops, y'all. We need all of you to step up. Once your vote is counted, I need you to talk to everyone in your network, make sure that you are volunteering for election protection, finding folks to, to become poll workers, share what you know with your family and friends. I need y'all to be like me calling your grandma, calling your mother, making sure that they know what they need to do, getting them connected with the election officials, finding, tweeting, uh, making posts on Facebook, texting. There are so many ways that we can get this information out and the Democracy Initiative is here to provide the, the language and the toolkits and the things that you need, right? We need to have a consistent message and it needs to be positive and the way that we shift that is by you stepping up and demanding that the votes be counted, that our postal service is funded, and that this work is getting done. So Joanne, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you've got it covered, right? Again, making sure you know, <laughs> you know, making sure you're keeping up with election changes. Again, there are changes that are happening every single day. Um, from there, making sure everything's up to date. Uh, if you've made a request, tracking it. Um, if, if October comes around, your ballot still hasn't come, you know, co contacting your local board, not waiting until the last minute. Um, and again, outside of that, doing more where you can. Obviously, you know, we know the health of our democracy is important, but your health is just as important. So if you know you're high risk, you know, there are plenty of ways that you can help from home. And I, I think Brittany has highlighted them all, right? Starting with your family, using show, social media, stepping in to help with text banks and phone banks, and maybe even signing up to host a training of your own. Um, but yeah, I think you've covered everything. <laughs> awesome. So folks, my email is at the bottom. Feel free to take note. I want to make sure that you have access to us. You can use us as a tool. We are here to support this work in the States. Oh, and then Nick, that's pretty yeah. helpful. Make sure you know or have bookmarked your state secretary mm -hmm. of state website, which usually has comprehensive voter guide lists and polling places. Yeah, Absolutely. I would say I would say though. So what we're finding is, depending on the state, the state boards aren't updating things online as quickly. You know, there just isn't 
they don't have great technology teams and so forth. So it might be where you're checking those, but also trust checking trusted organizations um, in your state. So League of Women Voters, Common Cause, you know, there were ACLU were watching all the time and they've probably updated it likely before the, the boards have. Um, so I check all of those sources beforehand. Absolutely. Thanks, Joanne. And honestly, you know, what, what we've seen, um, we've done a few trainings and we've had conversations with our partners. What they're doing in Georgia with the, uh, is it, hmm. With, so in Georgia and in North Carolina, what they're doing is they're building, they're identifying volunteer liaisons to build relationships with those local elected officials. Because the reality is, is a lot of times there's maybe two or three people in those offices and the, at the county level. And so you got to reach out and connect with them because they are being overwhelmed. They are being asked to implement um, a system and a process that typically takes several cycles to establish. And would they have to do it in a couple of months during a pandemic and an economic crisis with limited funds, with limited access, with limited information and guidance. And so they are just under pressure. They're not the enemy. And it's important to support them and let them know that you don't know, you don't think they're the enemy. You just want to come in and support. They may need, they're already asking folks to volunteer to count ballots, right? And so maybe that's what it looks like for you. You're, you're volunteering or identifying folks that can count ballots, but it's going to take all of us to get this done. All right, so winning with vote by mail, right? As we do all of these things, it's important that these effective conversations, these are conversations that we're having with our friends, our family, and our colleagues, they're effective and we actually tap into what they're worried about and what, they've, what they're concerned about and what they've heard so that we can center what their understanding and what their plan is going to be in the truth. Because there's a lot of confusion um, I know that like 74% of voters are, have some concerns about vote by mail. And it's because there's been so much intentional disinformation and misinformation coming from our opposition. And sometimes, a lot of times coming from us, right? Because we're all pulling information from different sources and we're not, we don't have a cohesive message around how to talk about vote by mail and how to talk about this election. It's important that you are practicing and having these conversations to ensure that people feel confident and they understand what, how important this is, right? And so these are just some simple tips for how to make sure your conversations are effective. And the other person leaves feeling confident and excited about this. We, we have, we are in the perfect storm, people. We are in a historical moment where we have two choices. We can continue to descend into fascism, or we can take this moment to stand up and take back our democracy and create a democracy that is inclusive of everyone in this country of immigrants, of poor, of poor people, of working, of working class folks, of black and brown people, of indigenous folks who even on this land are seeing their rights being ignored and disrespected till this day. And it is important that we use this moment to push and propel us into a 21st democracy that includes all of us, that is representative of all of us and benefits all of us. So use these tips to in your conversations and remember, like when you're, when you're identifying and teasing out people's concerns and doubts, you just point them in the direction of information that is accurate, right? And then you give them sources. And we, the Democracy Initiative, are happy to be a source of valid information. And we're happy to point you to, um, point you to other valid resources. So feel free to check out our website. Reach out to us. You have my email address. You have links to the trainings and things so that we can provide folks with the information that they're asking for. Right, and then once folks know that they have their plan, they make they made their plan. They're gonna talk to everybody they know. Then you see, okay, I'm glad that you said, but you it can't just be you. I need your house. I need your block. We need your family, your friends, people you don't like that much. All of y'all need to step up. So what are you comfortable with doing? Because it has to go beyond just voting this election. We have to make sure we're bringing everyone along because this is not just this is not just today that we're fighting for. We're fighting for the future of democracy in this country and the world is going to take our lead. All right, I see, do you have a question? Yeah, I told him we get to. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Ooh, oh, let's finish through this and, um, and Stephanie, we'll get to this question. This is a good question. Um, and so the reality is, is in this moment, 
we have to create an effective and equitable vote by mail infrastructure. It's gonna take all of us. And we also have to fill those 900,000 pro worker spaces. How are we filling the gap? So you all have to engage, identify folks, get them trained, let's get them trained. I'm happy, I will train anyone and everyone, right? And we'll place them, we'll connect them with organizations that are doing the work on the ground so that they can be plugged in where they feel comfortable and they can play a role in this work, right? So uh, vote by mail captains, we need those folks to champion in the states and be leaders so they can identify those valid sources. They can be trusted advisors. They can, um, they can share that information and give it back to us so that we can help support the work that's happening on the ground. And y'all, we have to demand a fully funded election and postal service. If we can bail out corporations, we can support the postal service. We can demand our elections be funded so that when you do show up in person, they have hand sanitizer, they can disinfect, they can so you can social distance. You are not risking your life or and risking your vote, right? We deserve that in a first world country and the wealthiest nation in the world, and we're going to get it. And so you can do that by contacting your senator and putting pressure on um, and participating in our corporate campaign to demand that corporations who want to talk about Black Lives Mattering pivoting and pivoting that energy to demanding that black votes matter, to demanding that voters matter, to demanding that our votes and our elections matter. It's backing us and our demands as people, as the collective people, to fund our elections and protect our votes, right? And then you sign up for these trainings. We're having, tra we have a training next Tuesday, the 18th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, you have, y'all have my email. Feel free to email me if you wanna participate in that training. We'll be hosting Train the Trainers every week from now to the election, okay? And, and, and onward, because this, this fight is not gonna end election day. We know that we are gonna be fighting potentially up until inauguration day, and we might have to, to, to physically uh, take back the people's house, right? We may have to go into the streets. We may have to demand that the election not be, be legitimized and the results heard. Right? So in order for that to happen, we need y'all to step up, mobilize your members to make a plan, ensure that folks know the rules. Again, make a plan and then demand that money for that safe, secure election, right? And be prepared to practice patience and to teach folks that they can't expect election results to happen um, in a day, in a week. We will be counting ballots potentially for a few weeks. And so folks need to know that now so that they can mentally prepare themselves for whatever disinformation and misinformation and lies we're going to hear leading up to and after the election. Now, Stephanie has a question about what plans our organizations have for the weeks following election day, right? And so for the democracy initiative from a national scale, we are, we are, um, convening, we typically have our annual meeting, we convene our partners. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be organizing and mobilizing those same volunteers to organize in the streets. We're going to be pushing our message, we're going to be pushing a message depending on how the election day goes. We're going to be organizing and educating folks on being patient, pushing that messaging, be patient, be patient. Do not allow them to take this to the courts. We're going to be fighting in the courts, fighting in the streets, and organizing and educating until, until uh, inauguration day. So that's what our work looks like. Um, Joanne, do you have any ideas of what Maryland is gonna be? Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I think this is for all of the states. I think post-election day, um, we're going to be focused on the canvas process. So the process for opening and counting ballots. I think one thing we didn't cover is that everyone should not be, you know, you know, we're used to like election uh, watch parties, right? Waiting for results that night, that on at that night, that will not be the case this time around. Uh, the canvas process is probably going to take two, three weeks, maybe even longer in certain states. So for our organizations, we're going to be uh, watchdogging that process the entire time, knowing especially that COVID has impacted the way that, that would typically work, right? We Sometimes we'd have uh, watchers inside from every party, um, but because of the social distancing requirements and so forth, you know, uh, the judges or the poll workers who are inside are now uh, having to social distance, which means fewer people inside these facilities. Um, certain states have different protocols in place that make it even longer. So for us, that's a bulk of it, making sure that everyone who voted, that their vote is actually counted. And outside of that, I think uh, for Maryland specifically, you know, 
January is right around the, right around the corner. It's the start of the legislative uh, uh, session for us. We know that vote by mail works. We proved it in the primary. Uh, so it's looking at ways that we can improve our current uh, absentee process, um, but possibly explore moving Maryland uh, towards vote by mail in the coming year. So I'm expecting a lot of election fixes um, once we're hopefully uh, done and, and having uh, opened and counted all of the ballots. Awesome, thank you, Joanne. I want folks to, um, to keep in mind, right? I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna leave you all with this. Or, or no, let me ask, are there questions? Do folks have questions? Because we have, yeah, we have some time. Mm -hmm. oh, I never end on time. I'm proud of myself, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, or not just questions, right? Are there things happening in your state? Um, yeah. What are y'all uh, seeing? Absolutely. I don't know if we're unable to unmute. Can people raise their hands and we unmute them? Um, great question. Nick? I can unmute. Okay, Nick. I mean, do you have, oh, okay, okay. I mean, it's if anyone, but it doesn't look like anyone has their hands raised or anything like that. Okay, cool. So proud to live in Colorado. Awesome, awesome. So I'm hoping that everyone <laughs> has just gotten the information that they needed and you've all, you know, uh, made plans on how you plan on voting in November um, and that you're hopefully tapped into something where you're helping with get out the vote efforts and hopefully election protection efforts. Oh. Brian says, curious what folks uh, think about the news that LeBron and LA Dodgers are trying to make the stadium a polling location. Oh. I have not been to, so I'm alarmed anytime I hear about these stadiums being used. I know that um, some states are using them now. I think we have to take a lot of different things into consideration, right? Uh, the first being whether or not it's an accessible location. So sometimes stadiums are out near a highway where a person has to drive to get there. There's no public transportation available, right? So it's not really a working place for the average everyday voter, right? So are they able to get in? Um, will parking be free that day? What the flow will look like inside the facility? I'm hoping that we're using the closest entrance uh, for people who might have disabilities, for elderly folks who can't stand in line for so long. Um, but there are benefits as well because it is a larger location. Um, but again, when you are consolidating precinct locations, it's, you know, it leaves us somewhat at risk of, of giving the voter the incorrect ballot and so forth. So there needs to be really well-trained judges that are at these facilities that will help ensure that the flow um, just works really well and that no voter is having to, let's say if the state has same day registration, that they're not left uh, having to cast a provisional uh, vote. Um, I'd say also network requirements. So I'm assuming stadiums have Wi-Fi and so forth, but a lot of election security requires uh, secure networks uh, where data is being sent, especially when someone's using same day registration. So I, I see pros and cons to it, but again, I guess for this location, it's, it, the biggest thing is whether or not it's accessible, um, even though the community likely is familiar with it. Awesome. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? We have, I think we have, we have a few minutes. Oh, okay, there's one in the Q&A and one in the chat. So you go ahead with the, go ahead with the Q&A. Q and A. Um, this is from Stephen again. I was reading about RNC coordinated poll watchers mm -hmm. uh, today. Thirty-five thousand poll watchers are their goal. Do you know how? If the Democratic Party is doing the same, or hmm, or coordinating with yours, so <laughs> I don't know if you want to take. I can only speak to Maryland. Uh, so Maryland, unfortunately, has not had a robust Dem-led uh, election protection effort. It looks like they are trying to ramp that up again. Um, but, you know, for us, and we don't, again, we don't coordinate with them. We try and keep our efforts nonpartisan. Our goal is to ensure that everyone is able to vote. Um, but we have been watching these RNC trainings. Some of us have been able to sign up and attend and so forth. Certain states have very strict rules on you know, who can serve as a watcher, what they're allowed and not allowed to do. But I, I think the Dem piece would be 
honestly state by state and how coordinated that party is. But uh, thankfully, we have the 866R vote election protection efforts that a lot of our states are tapped, a lot, a lot of our orgs are tapped into that will be on the ground uh, just because we know that we'll see a lot of Republican uh, at the polls on election day or during the early voting period. I mean, I just have to uh, second that, right? Like we work mostly with nonpartisan organizations that are doing election protection, like the Lawyers Committee, like Common Cause. And so we, um, we are recruiting folks from a, from a nonpartisan perspective as well. I sincerely hope the Dems are lining up folks because Lord knows they don't need it. Yeah. So I think it's important to, you know, if, if you're not seeing those efforts, identify organizations near you, yeah. like Common Cause, like the Lawyers Committee, like League of Women Voters, organizations that are trusted, that already do this work and know it like the back of their hand, right? Yeah. If, yeah. if the Dems aren't doing it, then you go find the organizations that are. Or reach yeah. out to us and we're connected with them and you're safe. Yeah. And I would just say also, even in like a very blue state, or I, I argue whether or not we're blue, right? but still in a very blue state like Maryland, you know, we see uh, tactics being used at the poll by Republicans. You know, in 2016, um, in certain parts of the state, there were trucks following people that were there just working on ballot issues, right? So these are things we expect, um, even though we know a state like Maryland will likely go blue in November. It, the goal for them is not to, you know, flip us, right? We're not going to turn red, but it's it's more of a how do we keep uh, these people from going to vote um, during these days instead, right? How do we depress the black and brown um, vote? Um, I see something about drop boxes. Oh, so yes. Um, so from Nick, anyone know of any efforts underway from secretaries of state or state's attorney generals mm -hmm. to increase the number of mail-in drop box locations? Mm -hmm. It seems like a no-brainer, especially in states with democratic governors like Pennsylvania and Michigan. Yeah, I know in Michigan, um, the the organizations on the ground, like Michigan ACLU, mm -hmm. um, are working very closely with the Secretary of State, with um, Jocelyn Benson. Their office has been really helpful. It's um, and so I I think that they have a they're just having the same issues with implementing implementation, right? Implementation and execution. And so again, it's going to take you calling on your senators, organizing folks to not, not senators. I'm sorry. Call your secretaries of state, demand that they increase the numbers of drop boxes, and then make sure that the list is not just increasing the number, people need to know where to find them. So making sure that the list of drop boxes locations mm -hmm. are clearly stated and can be shared, right? So yeah. I think like if, if they are not pushing, it's up to us to push them to think about adding more drop boxes, to think about getting creative about how to make this um, mm -hmm. to make that happen. Yeah, and I think that effort is in all of the states, the states where we work and even the states where we might not have offices there. I think uh, everyone agrees there needs to be more drop boxes. When we saw them used in the primary, they were really popular. But I think the biggest piece is the funding, right? So a lot of the states, even here, right, where we need 20, 20 million more dollars in order to conduct our election, right? So that federal funding is going to play a critical role because when we want to buy more boxes, um, it's not just the cost of the box boxes is cost for 24-7, uh, 24 24-hour round-the-clock surveillance as well. Um, so that funding is going to play a critical role in whether or not the states are able to move forward with more drop boxes, um, even if they want to, right? You need to be able to afford it um, as well. Okay. All right. I think we're 11.54. We have a couple of minutes. Um, but I honestly, I just want to thank everyone for participating in this today. Um, like I said, I love to train and I love to talk to people who are passionate about defending democracy. Um, Y'all, we are winning and it may not feel like it. And sometimes we get down on ourselves, but we have to recognize that they wouldn't fight this hard if they didn't know our power and our potential. And so making sure that we remember that and that they wouldn't be pressed to suppress our votes, to make us think that we're not winning if we didn't have the capacity and they didn't see this, the writing on the wall. So keep that in mind when you get down and depressed about the latest tweet or the, ne the next crazy thing that's gonna happen because I'm sure we're, about now, I'm sure there's gonna be something that happens in the next five or 10 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you remember that all of this is to keep you from being great, right? Mm -hmm. Our democracy deserves to be fugu, right? For us, by us. It can only be for the people and by the people. So remember that. And when you get frustrated, 
reach out to us at the Democracy Initiative. We will light a fire under you and get you placed so you can channel that energy and that frustration into some work. Yeah. So we can defend our democracy together. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I think we've covered everything. I would just say just on a final note, you know, if you see any disinformation that is being shared online, you know, don't amplify it. Don't like it. Don't engage with it because you are increasing the views. And unfortunately, you know it's false, but someone else who's reading it takes it and runs with it. I would also say don't forget, you know, that there are tools, LTEs, letters to the editor, op-eds, you know, providing voters uh, throughout your state with information on how to vote. Those help reach other audiences that we might be missing um, online. But I, I think the biggest piece is don't amplify the information that's incorrect. If anything, I would flag it for your state and local board to see if we could report it, I should say, to see if it could get taken down um, and instead count Counter that with uh, the correct information. So also, um, the Democracy Initiative, we have another training today at four o'clock. Our executive director, Wendy Fields, and Jahadi Moore from Community Change are going to be uh, running a training on how to effectively inoculate and using your plan to inoculate against misinformation, right? So there will be tips on how to beat, back, beat it back on social media, how to talk to folks about it, and how to shift the narrative, right? So check that out. And then tomorrow, we have a panel um, that is called Democracy No Longer Deferred, Following the Grassroots, Leaders from the Grassroots is a winning strategy because we see, we know, we believe at the Democracy Initiative that the most oppressed lead the best. And we've seen that um, when you follow folks, who know what democracy does, looks like and what it looks like to not have access to it, they have the most effective strategies and tactics and narrative and messaging to connect with communities who want to fight to have access to democracy and to win on campaigns. And so come check those that training out at four tonight and at 11 tomorrow, our panel. So if you wanna learn more and hear from folks who have actually successfully implemented these tactics and mobilize folks. You'll hear from folks who have worked on felony disenfranchisement. You'll hear from folks who are working with um, low-income domestic workers, right? And you'll hear from folks who are fighting um, to protect dissent in this country from um, environmental justice advocates, right? So our time is up. We love you. Enjoy the rest of Netroots. Thank um, you, everyone. Enjoy the yeah. rest of the conference. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Nick.